And then I would like to introduce the next speaker, Holger Fröhlich, um, is a professor at the University of Bonn and actually heads the data and AI group and is as well the uh, deputy head of the Department of Bioinformatics at the Fraunhofer Institute for um, Scientific Computing and Algorithms. He is uh, specializing at the moment in systems medicine, applications of knowledge graphs and multimodal data integration. Holger, the floor is yours. For the kind introduction and uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, um, I'm happy for being invited here. Yeah, so today I wanted to um, talk actually about a topic around uh, modeling of disease trajectories. But before I move into the actual topic, let me just uh, briefly embed this a bit into the general content of what we are doing in our team. So. Um, Fraunhofer is, in essence, in the academic uh, landscape of Germany, a rather special organization since it's a kind of bridging between uh, the basic research that universities do and um, the more applied research that typically is done in companies. And as such, um, we and our team here have, in essence, two major focus areas. So on one hand, um, we develop and apply methods for early drug discovery and on the other hand for uh, precision medicine. And of course, um, as you can imagine, so while looking at such applications, there are typically methodological questions um, coming up. So um, for example, how to combine human knowledge, uh, for example, via knowledge graphs, um, with indeed more data-driven approaches, how to model time series, and of course also how to um, fuse data across the biological scales. So um, we do this actually with a quite different types of data, uh, so which span omics more classically, longitudinal clinical data, um, real-world evidence, um, up to also digital biomarkers, uh, more recently an unstructured text. And uh, this is all um, actually uh, developed along a value chain which starts from questions how to bio reconstruct biological models, how to identify target candidates, how to bring the right drug to the right patients and eventually to support clinical trial design via the simulation of synthetic cohorts. So in essence, what I want to talk today about is specifically here about um, the third aspect here, so precision medicine. And um, there, of course, one of the aspects is um, that we need to understand many diseases from a longitudinal perspective. So diseases have oftentimes a certain um, development, a certain progression, a certain trajectory. And this trajectory can be very heterogeneous if you look across different patients. And um, a particular example of this is, of course, neurodegenerative diseases, so such as Parkinson's disease, um, which have, in essence, an incredible high veracity of um, the symptomatic uh, presentation of the disease and also how the disease uh, progresses over time. So in essence, if you now look on these um, disease trajectories, so then in principle they provide quite some information about how the patient is developing. So of course in terms of the dynamics of the disease, if you um, look at the novo diagnosed patients, um, also about the stage of the disease, and um, of course also if you um, later on then might want to look into a um, time after the observation window for predicting certain disease outcomes. So um, on the right hand side you find here a figure that actually also uh, proposes exactly this idea see, which has um, been by the way here co-authored by several um, people here from Switzerland um, including um, people from, from Novartis. And uh, well, now one of the questions, of course, is what can you now do um, with these type of data if you have it? So in principle, I see uh, personally different aspects. So on one hand, one can ask, so can I, if looking into such trajectories, identify a certain um, clusters, so groups of patients that somewhat develop similarly? Likewise, you can ask, are there basically typical pathways of patients' uh, trajectories that you could identify? And the third aspect is, of course, to do exactly develop model that predict, for example, the risk um, to develop a certain outcome um, later on after the observation horizon. <clears throat> 
So in, in principle, we are working on all of these aspects, um, but uh, for the following, I want to focus here a bit on this first one, so the clustering aspect. So in essence, um, the idea is here to identify patients with similar patient journeys, right? And um, in essence, uh, the, the idea is that this in turn could then of course also help to uh, reach to personalized prediction of, for example, the type of progression that a patient has, which in turn then could um, in the future then um, potentially help to develop tailored treatment for a particular type of progressors. So there's the idea then of a better personalized medicine behind. So, of course, when doing this and thinking about this, there's a number of challenges that need to be addressed. So, while looking at such data, so um, typically we are here talking about data that, uh, for example, comes from clinical studies, these time series that you observe are relatively short. So, from a data science perspective, this is, of course, then uh, quite difficult um, to model appropriately the dynamics and to uh, find uh, really reproducible patterns. So the existing time series clustering methods that are around are typically designed for data, uh, for, for time series which farm more data points. And um, another aspect is of course that um, opposed to um, what you see in many other data types here in these studies here, you have typically only a few hundred patients, which again makes the task quite challenging. And the third challenge is um, the aspect of missing data. So, um, of course, when you look into patients, and specifically patients and studies over time, so then typically you will observe that patients drop out at some point during the study. So this could um, actually be, um, the, the, this, this dropping out could by itself be correlated, for example, to a disease symptom worsening of the patient, um, and the patient by um, intention actually deciding to leave the study. So missing data in uh, clinical studies is actually therefore oftentimes not at random. So um, there's a correlation um, between missingness and observed data possible. Of course, multiple imputation methods have been uh, around for a long time, but any imputation error, so any imputation method that you will do will of course induce errors, that's unavoidable, and these errors will then of course be propagated further into any sort of clustering that you will do. So for that purpose, um, in our work, actually, we um, decided to develop an own approach, um, which we call variational deep embedding with recurrence and short VEDA. And um, this method actually um, has the intention to cluster multivariate time series data um, over so which data trajectories, really, with, uh, which are, um, we contain multiple outcome variables and at the same time implicitly impute missing data. So the input to VEDA is therefore a multivariate short time series data, which is initially encoded via a peephole LSDM, and of course an LSDM model eventually leads to a hidden state variable that um, we can concatenate over the different observed time um, 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 stamps or time points and then um, via an encoder, project to a lower dimensional space and likewise, of course, decode. Um, now, one of the special aspects of VEDA is that opposed to a classical variational autoencoder, so where the um, latent um, codes are assumed to follow a univariate, so a um, one Gaussian distribution, in this case here we have a mixture of Gaussians, so a latent Gaussian mixture model. So, um, therefore, of course, also the according optimization criterion that we have, so the, the elbow criterion, which you might be aware of in a variation autoencoder, is modified such that you incorporate um, here indeed um, the Kalbach Leibler divergence to a Gaussian mixture model as a prior. So, um, another aspect, as I said, so is here an important aspect is the handling of missing data as directly as part of model training. And uh, this requires, again, then a modification of the loss function. So more specifically, what we do here is, um, or what we aim to do here is, um, via our so-called imputation layer, how we call this, is um, 
that we want to only learn to reconstruct um, the observed data, of course, with our model at the end of the day. And for that purpose, in the, um, we introduce certain indicator variables that encodes the missingness. So, for example, in this case here, which you see here, um, you might have a certain score observed over time, and maybe the last two time points are missing. So we um, introduce a missingness indicator here, so that has here um, for the observed data um, zeros and later on ones. So um, based on that, um, so this missingness mass, we can then um, modify the reconstruction loss part in the elbow criterion. So this is the one part of the story. The other part of the story is the um, then occurring implicit imputation. So how is this working? So this is actually working by um, introducing for each of the missing data points in this so-called imputation layer, so a layer that's um, basically present before the uh, LSDM encoder, um, a trainable weight. So this trainable weight actually adjusts according to um, optimizing the reconstruction um, loss plus, of course, um, the... Uh, 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 the uh, difference to the prior, the cobalt lab light divergence to the prior. So um, this is possible because, in essence, um, the different outcome scores that are modeled here by our model are not independent, but they are via the neural network and, of course, also um, implicitly via the, uh, uh, how these scores uh, behave are um, not independent. And um, therefore, any sort of um, adjustment of the weight that you do for one of these missing values will eventually propagate further to a change of the, um, of the reconstruction loss part of the elbow criterion. So um, we have evaluated this model initially based on various um, simulated data as well as benchmark data, but I will not go through that here, um, but rather directly jump here to an application so I initially talked to you about Parkinson's disease in essence. And um, this is just an example um, of, of something that we have done here um, using the um, PPMI study, so which is in essence one of the referential studies in the Parkinson's field. And um, well, one of the things that you can of course have to initially do is when you train such a model, you have to think about um, how to choose the number of clusters, right? So and uh, in our case here, we do this with the help of the so-called prediction strength method, so which is a method that has been proposed initially by Tipsharani and co-workers and uh, resembles actually the logic of a cross-validation for supervised learning. And um, what you can do now is you can, uh, in essence, not only cluster your data once while running our model once, but you can... Um, while uh, acknowledging the fact that any neural network is, of course, um, subjective to how you initialize the weights, you can do this multiple times. And uh, that then eventually results into a distribution of prediction strength values, which you can then, um, which is here shown in blue here, plot as a function of the number of clusters and can compare against this distribution that you would get if you randomly shuffle the assignment of patients to clusters, so a null model. And then you can, for example, choose a number of clusters for which you find a significant difference in essence. So in our case, you would choose the lowest number, okay, such as indeed uh, the model, model for the true cluster assignment outperforms the model for a random assignment. So, um, and then of course, another aspect is that uh, you can then run, in essence, a consensus clustering. So what you find here is um, on, the, on the right, on the left-hand side then, is as an example, as I said, so this clustering obtained for this PPMI data by um, looking into six different uh, typical outcome scores in parallel, so scores that um, have actually assessed different dimensions of the disease, so motor symptoms as well as non-motor symptoms, so such as, for example, sleep impairment and um, behavioral aspects, um, also aspects regarding, uh, regarding to um, post grades, uh, uh, gait stability. And an interesting aspect is here that, indeed, we find here uh, these three different uh, tra tra trajectories here. 
which are visible along um, five of the six outcome measures, but for example, not across this um, third one here, so the three more dominants here. So which, which can perfectly make sense, so it's not necessarily expected that they uh, discriminate all outcome measures. So now what the relevance of this is, of course, um, also from a study perspective, if you set up a, would set up a trial, so that indeed here, according to this model, about one third of the patients do not demonstrate a significant disease progression here. So, of course, one can ask whether these clusters are at the end of the day a result of confounding effects simply, and one has to ask these questions. So, therefore, we made a number of, made a manner of checks. So, for example, we looked into the um, time since the initial disease diagnosis. We looked into the time since uh, the start of the therapy. We looked into gender uh, differences and of course also age, and in, the, in essence we can see no diff significant difference statistically in any of these uh, parameters here. What we do see, however, is that um, patients in the slow progressing group are typically younger, um, which um, means that uh, a later disease onset um, is somewhat correlated with a faster progression, as for example also proposed in the literature. So what we then did is to um, look what baseline parameters, other than the ones that we had used longitudinally, might be associated to each of these different clusters. And we did this, in essence, by um, fitting a Spark Scrubler zoo in a bootstrap, so in order to assess the uh, statistical significance or confidence of each of these um, parameters. So there was, was a number of different um, modalities that we assessed in this way here. So genetic loci, um, disease, disease symptoms, as well as uh, biological mechanisms. And this slide here just summarizes um, some findings that we made. So in the slow progressing group here, we found, for example, that patients typically had um, difficulties with their hand movement, rigidity of epilepsy extremities, they had an extended daytime sleepiness, ancient tea, depression, fatigue, a reduced semantic fluency. And we found here also, for example, an association to a polygenic risk score that has been in the literature developed um, for Parkinson's disease, as well as an association to several um, PD associated SNPs. Moreover, we found here an association to um, vitamin and disaccharine metabolism and um, to, enter, to uh, genetic variants in interleukin receptors. On the other hand, for example, in the moderate group here, we find um, other symptoms like, for example, eating behavior, which is impaired. Um, again, here we find several SNPs. Um, we find um, an association to cholesterol metabolism and to a vascular endothelial growth factor signaling. And um, in the fast uh, progressing group here, people had extended hallucination, post postural instability, gait impairment, um, REM sleep disorder behavior, and um, extended uh, yeah, genetic variations in um, genes in associated to vesicle transport, which is um, thought to be one of the key mechanisms in uh, Parkinson's disease. And by the way, actually also um, low CSF amyloid beta value, so which actually would speak for a neuroinflammatory component, specifically in these type of patients. Of course, one has to say that this is a finding here at the moment in these PPMI patients. And of course, the immediate question is in how far is this generalizable to the entire uh, disease population, and um, there I can directly connect actually to um, the previous speaker here. So finding a study that has uh, very um, similar characteristics in terms of patients, A, eh? so P PPMI patients here are de novo diagnosed, yeah? so and followed up relatively long here, so we have here in the data from 60 months of follow-up. So finding such a study with a similar set of data modalities or features is incredibly hard. Yeah? So, so, and uh, I must honestly say we haven't fully succeeded with that yet. So we have a number of studies now while um, working in a EU-wide project around Parkinson's disease. So, but these, of course, are all slightly different than PPMI. Yeah? So this is, this is, I think, from my perspective, really a big issue still. Yeah? 
Um, but at the same time, I would also like to point out another issue. Um, so it's not only about finding the data, it's also about actually getting the access. And this is indeed, again, incredibly hard. Yeah? It's because it's typically involving a legal framework, so um, which from my perspective and my uh, experience can easily take up just six months yeah, to make recording contracts. Yeah? So, and you then, of course, entire, the entire work takes longer and longer and longer, as you can imagine. Yeah? So, um, I think we have also to take this aspect into consideration. Um, one last thing which I um, forgot to mention here, so that these clusters, by the way, also um, seem to respond to difference to motor symptom therapy here, so which was also quite interesting finding here. So, um, while at the same time not showing differences in treatment regime and um, the L-DOPA equivalent dosage. So again here, it is uh, not so easy to reproduce such findings in other data sets also because patients in these uh, other data sets might not have actually um, the, same, um, uh, uh, the same treatment at exactly the same um, time differences to, the, uh, uh, to, to where they took the medication. Yeah? So here our clustering was built on so-called off-score, so when patients had uh, not been on treatment for at least six hours, in other studies you find that, for example, people have you know, just very recently taken their medication, and then it's, of course, it's not directly comparable anymore. Yeah? So it's actually quite tricky. So um, to sum up uh, this project and um, to talk a bit about the potential impact, so um, many diseases, of course, demonstrate highly heterogeneous trajectories. And here I just elaborated a bit on Parkinson's disease as one example. And from my personal point of view, disease trajectories in many diseases have to be understood really as multivariate. So, because there's oftentimes um, not the one and only outcome measure that appropriately describes how symptoms develop over time. So, um, oftentimes, as I said, so these data, these trajectories are short time and they contain missing data, missing values. And here we, for this purpose, here developed specifically our method here as a novel approach to uh, uh, identify clusters of disease trajectories. I see there um, the first several impact points, potential impact points. So on one hand, of course, one could use such a model, such a clustering to exclude patients that are likely slow progressors in a study. Um, one could, of course, also use uh, a stratification and a build on a study uh, more at the end of the study and uh, include this information as covariates in the statistical uh, analysis uh, then at the end of the study. And of course, a third aspect is um, that um, the association with molecular mechanisms, as for example found here, opens the door to develop subgroup-specific treatments in the future. So with that, um, I'm at the end of my talk, and I want to acknowledge, of course, um, the people in my team here, and of course, the um, diverse um, funding um, organizations um, that help to make this possible. And specific acknowledgements here go actually to Johan de Jong, um, who is uh, at the moment uh, building up his own group at uh, Böhringer. And uh, thank you very much again for your attention. And of course, I'm very happy to talk to you during the coffee break. <laughs>